Good evening and welcome back to the shop here in beautiful Canterbury. Rainy, stormy, thunder, lightning. Maybe we'll lose the feed, but hope not because tonight I want to talk about finishing. And I'm not going to blab on though tonight. I'm not going to blab on. I promise. <laughs> I'm going to let you throw out the questions and direct the conversation. And I actually want to hear some of your favorite finishes and methods and techniques as well. Um, so we're trying just this every once in a while to do a little freeform forum where we can talk about wood finishing and maybe others can benefit from your experiences and your questions. So. Feel free to ask away. Before we get into that, I want to um, just remind you, we're having a blast in the Queen Anne footstool course. We actually got the sides glued up like this. So we're coming down the home stretch. We've got to put that knee block in there next. That's going to be a little tricky. And around the knee, and then glue up the sides. But We've already got it nicely rabbited on the top for the slip seat to go in there. But it's a pretty sweet design, and I'm feeling good about how it's going. So if you want to join us, you can check you that out over at epicwoodworking.com. You can find that course. And of course, like, share, and subscribe if you like this content. And by all means, get on our mailing list on, so that you can see what's going on. Thank you for being here tonight. Let's jump in. We are going to talk tonight about finishing all kinds of Your questions aspects of it. are already or, coming in, Tom. What? Questions are already coming in. Okay, good. Because <laughs> I was either thinking he said, it was going to be a lot of questions or we were going to have a very short night. <laughs> <laughs> so he's got his phone so he can look at the questions oh. directly tonight. And oh, my gosh. I don't want to see myself. I see myself on a, how many second delay is that? Who knows? Don't worry about it. It's, okay. it's just seconds. Uh, okay. Wait, yeah, I, this is cool. So I should scroll up. How am I going to know which one's the answer? Oh my gosh. Hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> this is cool. I had never really realized who was on here. All right. Um, although I do read the comments afterwards. Um, All right. <laughs> Sorry, I'm really bad at this. Oh, you're not. I'm seeing a lot of weather and stuff. Oh, and sorry. And William from Brazil. Oh, my gosh. Hey, William. Um, okay. Sorry, that wasn't a question I thought it was. About French polishing. Over 800 polishing and wet sanding between coats. Oh, I've seen cool... Video of French polishing piano, of, of French polished piano. It was over 800 polishing and wet sanding between coats. Oh, um, not sure what that means. I, I sanded? I think he's just making an observation. Out okay. There. Well, there's question marks at the end. So, um, go down to French polishing actually is not sanded between coats. Um, you're, you could after you brush on the first couple, but once you get into patting it on, there's no sanding. It's all just padded on. And, but could be 800 coats by the time you go over it so many times. Um, let's see. QFT is a question for okay. Tom, so start with Cam there. All right, Cam, I see you there. <laughs> How long should you wait between the final coat of water locks and a top coat of wax? Hmm. Good question. Well, water locks is, for those of you not familiar, is like this product here. It's um, a tongue oil varnish, oil, tongue oil. It's a polymerized, so it does cure much better than the natural ones. But let's see, Cam. I think it says right on the can. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not no. going to just read all the cans tonight. That's what I can do. <laughs> all right. Uh, that was a good question. Uh, no, well... Of course, you do want to follow your instructions on the can, but toss those out and listen to what I'm going to say. No, I would just, uh, usually I'm waiting for it to dry in order to rub it out finally. Sometimes you're going to 
rub it out. And a lot of times with varnishes like this, if I use a satin varnish, the whole point of the satin is not to have to rub out the sheen a whole lot. So I usually just very lightly go over it with a 1200 grit paper, very lightly to take off the dust nibs. And then you could hit it with 2000 grit or whatever. And then, you know, you could put a wax on after that. But if I'm going to rub it out, I wait at least a week. So if you're just done, and you're not going to actually rub it out with a, an abrasive, like a polishing compound, then you can get, I mean, you could wait until it feels decently dry. Now that's a different time frame in the summer. Right now, we're having a lot of humid days. Uh, they're warmer, but um, in the winter when it's dry, and if you have a warm enough shop, finishes dry pretty rapidly. And I would say you could be, you could feel good about this being done if you're putting on thinner coats in like three or four days. But if you're going to rub it out, I would definitely wait a week. Hopefully that answers the question. Um, what durable finish would you recommend for a tabletop? Oh, boy. Um, there, Waterlox is a good finish for a tabletop. The, the big dilemma that you have when deciding on what to put for a finish on a top is some of the most durable finishes are not the most appealing. And they're... They're not the most appealing in terms of uh, sheen. They almost, like, particularly if you have just straight polyurethane. Um, it's incredibly protective. Really great for that. But it, it just, it's a very hard resin. So I was just speaking about rubbing out the finish. Uh, that's like when you, you can hit it with steel wool and burnish it up, or you can hit it with a, a finer compound. Um, and bring up the sheen a little bit if you wanted, but you can't really do that with polyurethane. It's so hard that it just scratches and it doesn't take an even burnishing sort of with compounds. So, but it's super protective. So you got that going for you. A lot of old timers used to use spar varnish on pieces because it's a softer varnish, very elastic, used a lot outside because it has that movability. And it took a beautiful rub out with, a, with um, you know, steel wool or, you know, bringing up the sheen a little bit after the fact. And it was very repairable. Where polyurethane, the harder varnishes, you've got to really sand them down before you recoat. So uh, just about varnishes in general, um, you could, I found a lot of good articles in the Taunton Press. This traditional finishing techniques it's one of those best of fine woodworkings. You can probably find them used or something if you don't have this one. But there's a lot of, if you have the fine woodworking catalog, you can just look up varnishes. If you're interested in that, you could use an old time varnish. So there you got, as far as oil varnishes go, something durable all the way up to polyurethane. Now, one I really do like that's quite attractive and has, in a way, the best of both worlds is like general finishes. Because this is a urethane blend. So it's not just straight urethane, but it has some of the other uh, more workable resins in there. So it's kind of halfway. Um, it rubs out a little bit, but I put, it on the, I put it on that writing desk I made recently, and I really like the sheen. But you could tell, man, it was a little harder. It wasn't as friendly to buffing out, you know, but it, it was fine. But this, this, I'd say if you really just want decent protective with the best looks, I would go for the general finishes. You can use the gloss. I always like the semi-gloss because it's a little toned down, or the satin, you know, depending on the piece. But for dining tops, I would go semi or satin unless you really want to try to get that full gloss luster. So other than that, if you're into spraying, you could spray like a product like this. Uh, this is Doravar by M.L. Campbell. It's um, a conversion varnish, uh, like a lacquer, a pre-catalyzed lacquer. So it's, it's pretty tough, but most, most people aren't spraying that because it's kind of dangerous and it's, it's a mess and you got to have ventilation and fans and it's all that. So hope that answered the question. Anybody else have thoughts? You can chime in. 
This is your chance. <laughs> Who else has adorable favorite finish for a top or something like that? We, they can read these comments long after, right? Yes. The night is over. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so if we're not able to read them all and you want to just keep listening, um, by all means. Oh, I see Michael. Uh, anyone have any experience with Rubio Monocoat? I don't, um, I don't have any, Michael, but I, did, I was just reading about it the other day that it's one of these one coat things where you put it on. It said something about it being, uh, um, it's some type of, is it some type of oil wax? I forget, I'm sorry. Uh, but it, a lot of guys, I've seen them just pour it on graciously and then use a large, slow spinning um, pad buffer to really work it in and work it evenly on the surface. I'm not sure how protective it is though, because it is literally one coat. And I've seen people do it on like conference tables and I question how, how good can it be? I've never had one work like that. Um, wow, a lot of questions, man. Okay. Question, uh, next question is from Bill Osmo or Rubio. Do you know, you know about, we've answered to Rubio. Do you know yeah, about Osmo? Yeah, I don't, I'm sorry. I, I, I am behind the times on those two <laughs> products. Osmo, I have not used, I've heard some people like it. This is a great chance. If you've used that, please chime in. I'd love to hear your experience with it. I'm gonna read all these later on. So any opinions or ideas or secret recipes, this is your chance. Food safe finishes, Tom? Uh, food safe finishes is always, you can always use uh, mineral oil is an easy go-to. There's Clapham's, which is a mix of like a mineral oil and a beeswax. I just picked this up. Um, oh gosh, I'm having a blank on his name in Florida. The, um, Mark? Mark, yeah, Mark. Mark, you know, you, if you're watching, you advise me with this uh, atomic finishes. It says, I just got this from this company. Could you put the link in there, Mark? If you are watching tonight for this, if they still have that special deal, they had like a special deal on this, so I, he let me know and I took him up on it. And he posted it in one of the SNLs, so if you're watching and you didn't do it, you missed out on a great deal. Anyway, this is uh, another one, and it's a premium blend of clear food-grade waxes, oils, and other natural ingredients that bring out the natural beauty of it. So I haven't tried this, but I've got this for my next food What's grade What's it called, did you say? Um, they call it wood oil, but it's by Atomic Finishes. Okay. www.atomicfinishes.com. It's not cheap, so if you can get that deal. I'll reach out to Mark if he isn't. Put yeah, so also you want to try using, um, what else? There are other ones out there, but those, those are the main ones. When I, when I just do a, like a, a cutting board, I'll just put mineral oil on that. Any other ideas people have used, uh, other products they like that are reasonably priced? That would be good to know. You want me to read them? Would that help? Uh, yeah, maybe. Okay. Bruce says, I grew up on varnish and hand rubbing with pumice and rotten stone. Why is it not done anymore? It's still done, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, I, I did that too, Bruce. You grew up with it? Were you like, uh, coming home from school and rubbing out tabletops? Maybe he was, had a grandpa or something. Oh yeah, him. sure. No, you know, the earliest articles I read, I remember reading in, in Fine Woodworking, we're about rubbing out with pumices. And so I did that exact same thing and I really enjoyed it. It worked amazingly well on polymerized tongue oil. Some of my earliest pieces like with the Furniture Masters when I was up here, I was doing it up here more I think early on. So this would have been 25 years ago and I would brush it on, you know, varnishes. That's what he said, right, varnishes and then yeah, so this is that issue, like it was soft enough to rub out beautifully. So it was, it was like the, a lot like the water locks, I think it was almost the same product. And I would brush it on with a badger brush. <laughs> these are not, these were like 35 bucks, these are badger brushes, and perfect for varnish. And then um, sand level the top, and then take a cheesecloth and some 
some oil for, for buffing out, and I would sprinkle. First, I went with the 2F and then the 4F pumice, and it worked beautifully. The reason you don't see them around anymore is because it's so much simpler to take the pre-mixed automotive polishes. You can get like 3M has like three different bottles. Um, Meguiar's has, has it too. If you go to your auto body dealer, <laughs> the auto body shop, and get, get set up with those, you're gonna see probably three. The final one is a swirl mark remover. That's gonna give you like the real mirror. But you really only need two compounds before that. Usually like 3M makes a series. So you just need two bottles and then you swirl mark, okay? Try that. It's just basically the pumice in suspension in this liquid that's already got like a waxy substance in it. So you can either hand rub or it, obviously it works. It's designed for buffing pads as well to go way faster. And if you're gonna do that, you need your buffing pads and a decent buffer. And you can get all that stuff online pretty cheap. Okay, this might be a question to refer to the finishing course. It might be longer, but you can see. Can you please discuss the difference between glazes and toners and when to choose one or the other to adjust a finish? Oh, that's a good question, actually. Uh, yeah, let me just give you a quick look, and I'm going to answer that really fast. I just want to show you that this is typically the way the finishing course or most finishing books are arranged like this. So they'll start out, they'll, they'll just have preparing material, things to do about preparation and all that, then coloring the wood with either pigmented stains, dye stains, or chemical reaction stains, you know, like ammonia and potassium dichromate or whatever. These are all those aniline dyes and um, NGR stains like non-grain raising and pigmented tend to be those like minwax that you're probably familiar with. Then, the, then after you're coloring the wood, you're into these protective surface finishes. So like top coats, films. So uh, it could be varnishes, which you've already talked a little bit about, or shellac. This is more of a surface. This is penetrating. Usually oils soak in a little bit. This is more on the surface. And then you can actually put on top of these finishes, it's like you feel like, oh, I'm already done. I put the protective coat on, right? That's it. I can't affect color anymore. Yes, you can with what you just asked. You can affect the color with special effects like glazes. So glazes are like a, um, almost like a cream, like a thin cream product. I don't actually have a can here, but I'm, I use the Mohawk glazes mostly. And most commonly I'm using the um, burnt umber and the Van Dyke Brown. That's, Van Dyke Brown's pretty dark, but if you want to cut the red a little bit in the burnt umber, you can add a little Van Dyke Brown. Uh, but anyway, the glazes go on top of the finish and you can wipe it for effects. They, the, the toners are usually thought of in an aerosol, okay? So you can spray almost like an air gun, you know? So uh, they make these other aerosol cans. I believe Mohawk has them. I'm trying to think of the other company. But the toners, they have beautiful little soft misting nozzles usually, and you can get different colors, and you can mist it into little areas. I found toners were incredibly useful when you were trying to do a repair of something and you know how you you repaired something that was already finished and you're like, oh God, how am I gonna blend this piece I just patched in there? Well, there's a lot of ways you can, you can try to get the color close before you know, putting the sealer on, but after the fact, if you have toners, you can just lightly tone that area. And one little secret of, <laughs> of fixing uh, antique repairs is if you put a little toner on the other part, it's not going to be noticed, but you actually slightly touch the tone of the antique part, and then the, the client goes, wow, amazing how you match that. Yeah, I just made it. <laughs> no. But you can do stuff like that if you have the right toners. I, I used to use those a lot. I don't do repairs as much, but I'd have at least a half a dozen different cans 
So you'd have the walnut, the mahogany, a maple, which give you a little more yellow. And so depending on the situation, you could just adjust. And you're just like wisping it on. And it's amazing how, how controlled it is. So you have a lot of control with the toners going on like that. Glazes are more in liquid form. So you wipe those on and you, they work really great in like uh, things where you want to ha have the appearance of depth. So wood turnings or when you wipe it off, the glaze is still captured in those deeper cracks and in round joints and stuff. And it imitates the look of age and like dirt and whatever. But it also adds this shadow like three-dimensional quality to it which is you can't achieve with the toner, you know, because the toner, if you're in an aerosol, it's just laying on evenly everything. So that's the main difference between the two. But once you get your glazes or toners um, or grain fillers, those effects, then you can put your final finish on. So after this, you would finish, put, add another finish, and then you would rub out your finish or whatever. So anyway, that's... That's the crash course in books. I should just say before I answer the next question that I've used this book like a great reference. I've mentioned this a number of times, but maybe if you knew, um, by Bob Flexner. It's revised now, understanding what he has a very simple way of saying uh, the kinds of things I just said and breaking them down. Jeff Jewett also similar, but you're going to find, I mean, how much is there about wood finishing? It breaks down like that outline. It can, it's going to be a lot, you know, there's going to be more added in, but that's essentially it, okay? There's a lot of little other nuances and types of finishes like French polishing you can get into, but okay. um, those, those two books, and then this one by Terry Masachi, similar to uh, Jeff Jewett's as well, but I can link all of these. Yeah, they all have after. like a little spin, and and usually you're you're dealing with one particular issue, like the, that toner or glaze question. You could go right to it and read it in three different books, and like get a a deeper saturation of ideas about it. And then of course you do a little experimenting, but you'll hear what different people say, and you'll hear things confirmed throughout. A um, couple, just lastly, a couple older method finishing books that I like a lot is Sam Allen and George Frank. Uh, these are older books, so I don't know what's available, but you know how it is on Amazon. You can get these used books all over the place. So there's more about those. That's enough. And we do have a, a class. I put it in the link uh, description called Favorite Finishings, Finishing Methods. Um, it's five hours of Tom talking about finishing. So Yeah, actually, it's that course. That, that outline, you know, of course, filled out with demonstrations. So it's kind of like a condensed, but there's so much further you can go with all of this. But okay, let's, let's move okay. on. Tom is asking, uh, he says, oak plywood for toy chest, light sanding, clear gel, then what? Uh, toy chest, yeah, you want a pretty nice protective finish on there. It's, it's up to you. Um, you could, I love shellac. You could spray shellac on there. It's a warm, uh, food safe finish. Um, what do you say put on there, oak, oak sand? Light sanding, clear gel, then what? Yeah, you could use the clear gel. Is that like a stain? Maybe clear yeah, gel. Yeah, it must be a gel stain. Maybe, he didn't say. Okay. Um, or maybe the gel is the finish you've put on. Uh, once you get it on your finish, I'm not sure if you're talking about a top coat over a stain or that's your finish, like a gel type. Maybe that's a stain. I'm going to assume it's a stain. You're going to top coat with something, something simple like shellac and gives you a great look. And I've done a number of videos where I've talked about shellac and then rubbing it out with steel wool and then putting a wax on it. You get like three coats of thin steel I'm uh, shellac, like pound and a half and the last one go like a two pound cut it's so beautiful and and low maintenance easy to fix too you know so things are going to get damaged but shellac the following coats just melt into the previous if you want that more durable kind of rugged finish um shellac's not bad but you could go with the the general finishes or something like that like a urethane blend and check that out you know 
I would, I would think in something like that. Okay. Tom says, all I know is mini, Minwax Stain and Poly, and there are so many products and methods. Where should I begin with branching out? Maybe that book, by Understanding books, Wood yeah. Finish, would be great. Uh, but yeah, that's exactly what I was just talking about, because um, even that course, if you wanted to do the course, but you can get it in the book, but if you're more of a visual learner and you want to see what it's, I break it down in a way. That's, I address that right near the beginning because I know you go, this is what I started with too. I remember the earliest project, you know, making Christmas gifts when I was a kid. This is what I went to and I thought, oh, this is amazing stuff. I didn't really understand what it was, but these, these have some dye in them, but they also, they mainly uh, stain with a pigment. They used, that's why you had to really stir it first. So there's like that sludge at the bottom. Um, that's partly um, what they call, oh gosh, it's, there's a hardener like the, the glue material. I'm forgetting the correct word. Somebody will remind me. Anyway, there's, there's the solvent, then the, the pigment, and then the uh, shoot, I'm sorry. it's like a glue. It's what it's what keeps everything there after it dries. You know, it's like a a s sticky hardening <laughs> substance. Somebody's gonna. It'll talk. come to you tonight, midnight. Yeah, oh, gosh. Anyway, this is mahogany, and uh, so when you stir it, there's some dye stain in the oil, but but the main the pigment is that a binder. Jack is a saying binder. Thank you, Jack. Gosh, the binder binds it all together and holds it on the surface. So that pigment is it works well on woods like oak or really open grain because the pigment is like a powdery really fine powder colored dust and that goes into the pores and, and acts as a colorant pigments are used all over like paints you know so opaque non see through paints they use a lot oils oil varnishes for painting and everything like that but Dye stains are another level, a different level of, of finishing. They, they have no um, pigments. They dissolve completely in the solvent. So you, a lot of dye stains, easy to use, are water-based. And professional finishers are using typically dye stains to start with, to color the wood. So you have a lot of control with them. There's a lot of different solvents you can use. You can... They can be in alcohol, lacquer, um, but usually it's alcohol or water, and then also in um, thinner. Anyway, the dye stains go on are very clear, and then you can seal them in with other finishers, finishes, and then you can go with toners. There's lots of effects you can do, but you gain more control, and it's not a one-size-fits-all. If you only experience polyurethane, you've got to check out shellac okay i've done videos on this and i have i i wish you could see some of the emails i get back from people who've tried it and just this week yeah they're like thank you so much for the and i know the feeling because that's exactly how i felt when i learned it with pug moore it's like i i can't believe how i've never used this it's an amazing traditional finish and it's not like old-fashioned it's you can buy it pre-mixed like this the clear or the amber in the can, or you can buy it in the flake and dissolve it yourself. I would start with the cans because they're, they have longer shelf life. I mean, once you mix this stuff, tents only have about a year, but in the can it has a little longer than that. Um, but if you get it in the flakes, it's really, it'll last a very long time if you keep it in a cool, dry place. That's the nice thing about that. So, okay, that's about it. Um have you ever heard of variathane, variathane? <coughs> yes. As far as I know, that's a, that's a brand. I think they carry it at Lowe's or Home Depot. Varathane is like, it's just a brand name of another finishing line, I believe. It's not a type of varnish. Do you know what, think of, what do you think about it? I don't. I'm sorry. I don't. I can't speak on okay. that. I haven't used it that much, but it's probably a, a decent... You're going to find a lot of the same products, but uh, no, I'm sorry, I don't have a lot. Okay, Jeff is asking, have you heard of Shine Juice? <laughs> well, 
Like moonshine? I don't know. <laughs> I, don't I saw know. the question, so. Shine juice. No, I'm sorry. Has anyone heard of shine juice? <laughs> Boy, that uh, product names you come up with. Okay, Peter says, I'm currently working on a maple counter t countertop. Should I shellac prior to water locks? No, no. Um, I, I, I have gotten, I feel like I, I know I've talked about that before, like using shellac under varnishes, like the way you can use it. I usually only use it under varnishes if I'm going to try to do some kind of effect like with stains or something and it's it's a protective coating or whatever. If you have Waterlux, Waterlux is a beautiful penetrating oil finish and it's going to go into that right into the wood. So you don't want to seal that with shellac. Um, Sometimes you only want to use shellac like under a wood that you're afraid is going to be blotchy if you put the oil directly on it. Like that can happen on pine and sometimes cherry. But most often, if I'm using water locks, I want to put that straight on the wood and thin the first coat by like about 10% anyway of paint thinner, like mineral spirits. Uh, you can even thin it. A lot of times when I'm using water locks, I actually thin all of the coats up to 20%. It makes it easier to brush on and or to wipe on if you want to use that approach. And then, but as you get near your last coat, if you put it on almost full strength, then you'll have more to rub out. But yeah, especially for a countertop, you don't need the shock there. Go right for it, right <laughs> on there. You're gonna get the full beauty and, and, and the look mm. of the oil like penetrating the wood. Okay, John says, a friend asked me to repair his dining table. He, I've never done that, and there's a ton of different ways I see online. A few minor scratches on top, but a couple two-inch to the wood scratches on the edge. Um, can it be saved? <laughs> <laughs> no, can I? I would throw it in the fire. <laughs> no, uh, actually, it's hard to answer a question <laughs> without seeing it, but um, dining tables are tough because... The first thing I think is when someone says they got a scratch on the top is how deep is the scratch? Um, because if it's only through the finish, you might be able to do some doctoring directly on the finish, but it's still so hard to repair that without it showing because you're, it's a horizontal surface and that is the most critically viewed surface of probably all finishes that can be on furniture. He I mean, says these are on the edge. Maybe that's all of them? a few minor scratches on the top, but a couple oh, two that's inch what I heard. to the he said a few minor on the top. That's You're what right. I was Sorry. addressing. Yep. The ones on the edge aren't as troublesome because you can probably hit those. You could fill those and then tone them. And then, you know, I'm not sure what kind of finish is on there. That's the other challenge, you know. If it's... Uh, it has to be compatible and easy to work with. If it's like... If it's a factory type thing, it's probably some type of lacquer or conversion type varnish finish. It's the, the hard conversions, those can be tough. Because when I say easy to work with after, it's like, does that finish, does it have like a, a melt inable quality? <laughs> you know, like mm. the uh, shellac and, and standard lacquers do. So you can actually do um, spot repairs at times, like on the side, it'd not be, but on the top, boy, it's tough. A lot of times there's no recourse but to strip it all down or fill that. And if you know what that finish is, lightly sand the whole top and, and spray another coat. But you run into all kinds of concerns about contaminants and polishes, and you might get, you know, it, uh, fish eyeing on you. I mean, all kinds of things can come up, but uh, if it's really the, it's hard to say. I, on a scratch on the top, I, it's almost unavoidable to have to refinish the top one way or another. You gotta fill those scratches, you gotta sand them out a little bit and try not to hit the, the color or you'll be toning that in before you hit it with the finish. Okay, Stuart has a question about Osmo finishes and um, Stuart, I'm not sure if you were here before. Tom's not really um, up on that, so he's not going to speak Someone's too probably clearly. Yeah, there's a couple that. comments in here on, on that, the people that have used it. Yeah. Um, so Bruce is asking, you typically recommend spray beeswax for a final coat. When should you reapply, and can you tell by touch? Oh, um, 
I don't know. It's, it really doesn't need it too much. Um, yeah, I've, I found this product. This is a, a lemon oil and beeswax polish. It depends what the piece of furniture is. Like when you're dusting, I have, I'm always dusting. I don't know about you, but I, I just find that the luster remains for a long time, and then I occasionally, when I'm dusting, I'll... I, <laughs> I almost <Oops>. missed it. <laughs> I, I, I shouldn't laugh. I'm I not use, much of a duster myself. So. <laughs> I know. I don't dust. But um, <laughs> anyway, no, you don't have to put polish on every time. It's just, it just when it starts looking a little dry to you or something, it's, it's all that. Because you, you'll see what the effect of, of wax is. It kind of... Uh, gets into all those like light little tiny scratches and it, it just gives you more of that fresh translucent finished look. It, it just makes it look rich. And okay, Bill says, how do you repair a lacquer finished tabletop where your teenage daughter spilled nail polish remover? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. That's, a, that's tough. That's not an uncommon thing, I would think. What, right, because the remover is the, the solvent in that is typically acetone, and acetone is a kind of thinner, obviously. Um, and yeah, it cut right in. That's, that goes to that other point. I mean, if it's on a dining table, if it's truly just lacquer on there, you could try doing a spot repair and it's hard to, to advise you but without seeing it. But worst case scenario is you're going to have to strip it all off anyway, right? Get it stripped off and then put on a new, build the new finish, right? But you could try to spot hit it. So in that area, I would sand it. And um, if you have to add color or whatever, you're going to have to add a little color. If you have some powder pigment, um, I think Mohawk sells and some places sell as a, like a blend-all powder, they call it. It's basically, it's pigment. It feels like cigar ash. It's so fine a powder. That's what pigments are. And um, if you had the right color, you can just lightly rub it on the spot to try to tone it in. And usually if you're going to miss the color, Miss slightly darker and it doesn't show as bad. But then I would just try misting over it with the best quality uh, lacquer in a can you can find. And then let it cure out and you're going to lightly sand around. You're going to do this like a couple, three times. And after, after two you might find, you just want to go kind of fast. And then you're going to level with... Um, I would use like a 1200 grit paper, sandpaper, 1200 with, with uh, a little water on the pad or you could use mineral spirits. That's not gonna hurt anything. And lightly sand it and then you're gonna rub out your whole top. You can buff out your top with, uh, you're gonna have to, I don't know how shiny it is, but you're gonna have to bring up the sheen to whatever that is. The 1200 is to level that lacquer that you sprayed down with the surrounding surface, and then you're going to bring the sheen of what you did to the other, which means you end up having to hit that, but you're going to have to hit everything again. You might get lucky, and that'll do it. If you don't, well, <laughs> you might have to do the whole thing. I would just recommend waiting till everyone moves out before you do that. <laughs> That's what I did, and I still haven't fixed our tops. We've, our house is like, you know, it's just the hard life of living in the house and three kids. Always thing to do. And there's a lot of little repairs I gotta we do some, myself. Some dog memories too. Yeah. All right, Alan says, I think this is a question. I keep getting small areas of bubbles that turn into pits on nitrocellulose. It, is applied, it was applied over trans tint in denatured alcohol. I'm going for a deep gloss polished finish. That's odd. Um, if you're getting bubbles, you definitely, you don't want to obviously stir. I don't know what kind of lacquer you're using, but when I spray lacquer, I rarely get bubbles. So it's either a contaminant on the surface is creating a bubble, but I don't think that would be it. And I don't know if you're using like 
stirring your own, maybe too aggressively, and then spraying it. I'm not sure why you're getting that. Um, one thing that you can use that when you're having problems with spraying lacquer, they make a product called a retarder, and it's a uh, you, it's like a solvent that you just pour and add a little to your finish. What it does, it allows the lacquer more time to flow out. And that's going to probably allow any of those bubbles to pop before it cures. So I would try getting some lacquer retarder. When you add it, it's going it, to it increases the amount of cure time. I mean, that's one of the things about lacquer that's so nice is that it it dries and cures really fast, but any defect in the finish is going to get locked in there. So one of the keys to, you know, issues like that clearing themselves is having longer time for that to flow out and those to pop before it cures. So try the retarder. Other than that, I don't know, I'm not sure if it's something else causing it, but you want those air bubbles obviously gone. So. Okay. Can you talk about buffing out? Is that... Uh Lengthy conversation, or is that? Um, not, not to, I'll just talk about it a little bit. I think the best way is to see it. Um, there's got to be some people who did stuff online. I don't know who's really good, who knows what they're talking about online, because um, you never know. But uh, you want someone who's experienced. Um, maybe Bob Flexner has something, but. The basic thing about rubbing out is once you've applied your finish, you want to have a, a heavy enough coat that you're not going to go through it, like in the rubbing out process. Some finishes, if you cut through the last layer into the next layer, you'll get what's a, a halo effect where you cut into the next layer. So wherever you went through, you see like this effect. And there's no getting rid of that. Once you go through, you have to recoat the whole thing. That's notoriously true with varnishes, like um, polyurethane. I'm sorry, polyurethane is hard to rub out, so most people don't rub out polyurethane. But but polymer as tongue oil, that that can do that to you. So the last coat, I usually try to put on full strength, so I don't rub through it. And the other key is when you're going to rub out a finish, like I said earlier with cam was wait at least a week if you wait two weeks that's better because it's going to rub out better it just has to reach like what they call full properties till that film is hard enough and but also will take the will take the rubbing out without streaking so that's that's a key you'll get such great results with um with the polymerized tongue oil the water locks if you wait especially with the satin, it rubs out beautifully. But the, the main thing is once you've got your last coat of whatever it is thick enough, you're going to come to it when you've dried, and you're first going to level the finish. So that means you've got to sand it. I typically start with a 1,200 grit around a felt block or a cork block, something flat. And you're going to you put some kind of liquid. You can use water or... Um, thinner, like mineral spirits, paint thinner, just in a spot. And sand lightly, and then you can squeegee it off or wipe it with a paper towel, and you're going to be able to see the dull spots. You want to create the whole thing should look dull like the 1200 grit. Now, some people, I used to start with a more coarse grit, like 600, go to 1000, then 1200, but I've learned and I've heard other people say this too. If you start that course, for some reason, it just feels impossible to get the coarser scratches out. And by the time you get to your final rub out, you're going to see those. So even though it takes a little longer, starting at 1200, you're going to be able to remove those scratches in the polishing phase. So just start there. You're going to go. It's going to go pretty rapidly. When you sand it, be very careful near the edges that you don't cut through, but you're just trying to level it first. Once you got it leveled, now you're just going to bring up the sheens with buffing compounds. And I mentioned earlier, you can get these compounds at automotive stores. You can do this by hand. It's a lot more labor intensive. Or you can do it with a little buffer with the different foam pads. 
So you dedicate one foam pad to each of the compounds. You don't mix them because obviously that pad is going to be contaminated with the more coarse compounds. So these are compounds, but they're very fine. So you want to start with like a medium grit after doing that. Then you'll go to the fine, and then you'll go to the swirl mark remover, and it'll be beautiful. But each time, you've got to clean it down really well. The whole success of that, though, is due to the leveling. If you don't get it level and you still have like little um, dips or undulations or whatever, those show up when it's polished. But if you can get it level, it's really something. So hopefully that's a crash course. I do show it, I think, the steps, but that's, that's the main idea behind it. Okay, Will's asking, have you heard about, uh, he says he's heard, been hearing about Odie's oil, Odie's, O-D-I-E-S, lately? Any experience with that? Yeah, that's, that's, I think someone said that earlier, didn't they? Um, I have not used Odie's, but, so I can't speak Osmo, on it. Osmo, they've been asking about Osmo. Oh, okay, Odie's is like another, uh, I have heard good things about it, but, as far as I know, it's a type of varnish. I'm sorry, I don't have personal experience. So this is a great time for someone to... Yeah, there's a lot of comments in. coming in here. And I'm, I'm behind because I'm sticking with the questions here. Okay, um, excellent. Let's see. This power in numbers. This is awesome. <laughs> this is really good. Um, okay, should you... John's asking, should you raise the grain with water first? Yeah, uh, if you're if you got a water-based finish, yes. I, you know, even if I'm going to put shellac, a lot of times I'll raise the grain anyway out of habit. You know, um, if you're for those who don't aren't familiar with that term, raising a grain is just like if you're whenever you use water dye stain on a piece of wood, if you sanded that material right before. You feel like, oh boy, this is beautiful. It's all softly sanded. Well, when you're sanding, you're actually abrading that surface with tiny little rocks, right, depending on the grit. So even if like 220 or you go to 320, it feels smooth to your touch. But if you got down there with a magnifying glass, like you would see like a very small serrated surface on there. So it's really kind of hairy because you it's like you're dragging little rocks across the surface. So when you put the water dye stain on there, those fibers swell up, and then when they dry, now a lot of those are like these, you're going to feel the surface, it's going to feel rough. And you thought, man, I sanded this. Well, no, those, all those little hairs stand up after the water. So typically, if you're going to put a water-based stain or finish on there, you should always pre-dampen the surface, let the grain raise up like that, raise the grain, the hairs stand up, and then you're going to lightly sand that hairiness off, right, with the same grit or a little finer than you finished with last time. You're not re-sanding, you're just lightly cutting them off, and then it feels silky smooth. Then when you put your water stain on, you're going to have a lot less, because you don't want to be fighting that with the stain on there. Um, one little tip, though, if you are familiar or comfortable with a hand plane, I mention this a lot of the courses that we do. If you can set a, a, like a final like um, polishing plane to, uh, if you set a plane really fine and take those last skim cuts across the surface, a, a hand plane surface leaves no raised grain. So I usually lightly sand after I do my final skim plane on the surfaces. But I try to plane most surfaces that are in view like that because, number one, you know you're going to get rid of the snipe and the joiner ripple marks, which sometimes haunt you. They show up after you've put your color on, and then you're like, oh, my God, it looks, you really don't want those. Those are unknown. But if you skim plane, they're gone. But when you skim plane, you also, you're not cutting the fibers the same way as sandpaper, which is like dragging these tiny little rocks. You're going by with a pristine edge that's slicing. So if you go microscopically down on that surface, there's no little hairs laying there. So if you dampen, try it sometime. Side-by-side -side test. Something you sanded, something you skimmed polished with a polished plane, you know, like a smoother. 
dampen them, and then go back over and wipe your hand. The, the one that you planed is going to feel just as silky because there's no little fibers to raise off. So that can save you a little time if you can skim plane. And you know, you're still going to sand some with a hand plane surface where you need it because it's not always perfect. But um, that'll save you some time raising the grain. So that's the thing. Anytime you're going to use a water-based finish, I would definitely raise the grain and go through that process first. And shellac actually can raise the grain slightly too, so I would do it in that case as well. Okay. Okay, Tony says, since they have changed the formula for Watco, what do you recommend for reconditioning an old Watco finish? Man, that's a good question. I, don't, I didn't know they changed the finish. Are they using other dryers? How recently was that? That's a good tip. Why don't you tell us what happened? Uh, whatever you know about it, I should read up on that. Um, a lot of these Danish oils, you know, they have like an oil and it's, it sounds really nice, but they'll put just kind of oil dryers in there and, you know, it's not the greatest, but I don't know what, I didn't know Watco changed their formula. So I thought it was compatible with others. And typically the, the older Watco, or maybe this, this is probably the newer stuff, um, it was very compatible, Danish oil in general, with other, with other finishes. Like you could put it over the top of even a lacquered finish, shellac, and some people used it like to revive antiques. I remember uh, following somebody who was, would restore antiques, and one of their secret weapons was to get in a piece that looks really kind of dry. You feel like, oh, I gotta put new coat of finish on this they would just wipe it down with Watco. So um, instead of just adding a polish, it actually added a layer of finish. The, the Watco went into all the little cracks, and you can even do this on the table. As it went into any light scratches in the material, and it, it makes them invisible, you know, because it soaks in there, and it revives the piece very easily. You could try it on a cheap antique that you thought, oh, man, this is dead. You try the waterlux. Danish oil is compatible. I'm not sure that they, I'm, I would be surprised if they changed the recipe that much that it's totally changed the working properties of it. So I'd be curious if it has. But uh, So I don't know how to answer that question. Tony says it became a wipe on poly. Oh, well, maybe, oh, yeah, okay. So Watco probably has different, products but they probably have one that's a wipe on poly but that's still have the danish oil um i'm talking about danish oil itself that this is a wipe on but yeah the the wipe on poly is probably just another product they have where they they have it's probably similar to the general finishes where they have a polyurethane blend uh that makes it wipe on a bowl um I know a lot of people who like the Minwax wipe on poly, but um, so I think I would just follow the directions when we can. <laughs> yeah, we don't have any courses right now on repairing tabletops. I've got a couple questions about that. Um, we did do, did you do any kind of Shop Night Live on repairing? We have done no, that. No, you know, but that's making me the think cradle. that would be an excellent, I, I got to do a video just a video on a restoring a dining table because that's a that's a common and it's a challenging thing and try to do it in such a way that you don't have to have complicated equipment. That's a great idea actually for uh, just a how-to video um, that would be you know maybe a course but I, it's just tables they they're so variant that that would be a fun one just to do as a Nice freebie video. Okay, Carlton's asking what catalyzed finish is. Catalyzed is a, um, it's a curative kind of thing. It, it, it's a molecular thing where once you have a, there's two types of catalyzed, pre-cat and post-cat. And um, the pre-catalyzed, when you buy it, it's already catalyzed. It's going to have a shelf life of, so long. It's like a, um, the, the, when I was first introduced to it, it was with lacquer like this. This is a catalyzed lacquer. But 
the earlier lacquers were just, you never heard the term catalyzed in the earlier days of lacquer. And because what lacquer was, was just purely an evaporative finish. It had the, the solids in there that were in suspension in lacquer thinner. So when you sprayed it, it would lay out beautifully and evaporate, and then you had your cured finish. And it would harden more and more. But if you sprayed it again with another finish over the top, the next coat would actually remelt the uppermost layer of that lacquer, and it would just melt in, and then you'd have like a seamless second coat. So you could spray three coats, but you never could even tell where the dividing line was because at each successive coat melted into the previous. Shellac has that same property. It's an evaporative finish that would melt into, and those were the most common for a long time. Then you started seeing this catalyzed thing come out, and what that was doing was adding a hardening and curing element to it that would made it tougher. So it, and it guaranteed it was going to dry. Sometimes it just helped accelerate the drying in some of these other more of an issue in conversion varnishes. That's something you probably never want to touch. But the lacquers, it just made them more durable. So now they had a shelf life, and it would say on the can, like if you're using a catalyzed lacquer, if you didn't recoat within a certain time span, then you had to sand it because the surface had cured enough in a molecular way, it was different. So the following coat wouldn't melt in like before. So now it had like a, a curative property, like a, um, a reactive, like, like varnishes are reactive. They react, they don't just evaporate and cure. There's a, a reactive layer of curing going on. That thing hardens, the next coat is not gonna melt in. That's why you always have to sand to a certain grit between varnishes so the next coat can have something to hold on to or you know, get a bite into the surface. So, but then you're, that's what you were suddenly seeing with Lackham, like, wait a minute. So that's when Adami and I read more about it, like the, the catalyzed uh, products have a harder, drier thing in there. They, they've changed the element of it. So post-catalyzed, you, you get a can of this, and it's, it's, it's like almost adding a two-part finish. So like, you know, epoxies, you mix two parts, and then you have a certain amount of time to use that epoxy because it's going to be hard in the can. That's what it's like. You use a post-catalyzed, you're going to mix it with the catalyst, and it's usually, like most of these door virus, it's a 10 to 1 ratio, so you take the varnish and then one part of catalyst, stir it up, and it'll say, you got like four hours to get that on the, a four hour window to spray that on or it's gonna be bad. And so, and you can spray a couple coats on within that time, but the, it's just creating a different, harder surface. So that is a great question. That's why you really, if you guys are really interested, you've gotta have at least one resource book like this that really covers it. And I do think Bob Flexner has a wonderful way of explaining it. And you go right to the varnish, right to the catalyzed section, and he'll break it down in a really simplified way. It's really, he's got the revised new one, get the new revised version, because finishing products are always changing. I mean, look, tonight we've had Odie's, Osmo, all these other ones, they weren't around when I started I ain't changing now. <laughs> no, I'm going to check those out. Go ahead. So. Don't knock it till you try it. No, I, I know. I, uh, I do so Joel's try. asking, what do you use to reduce blotching? Uh, that's, blotching is an issue where the, it's, it's something inherent in the particular wood. And I mentioned earlier that it most happens with cherry and pine where you get like absorption into this one little area where the grain tends to swirl up or it could have some weird kind of, not a fungus, but it's just kind of like a weird acceptance of finish in a variant way that looks a little blotchy. I think sometimes cherry gets a bad name for being blotchy when it's really not. It's just some interesting figure that's rolling and I don't like to mess with that, but 
Usually you can tell if it's going to be blotchy, but if it is going to be blotch prone, I spray it first with a wash coat of shellac. So I'll put shellac on the surface, uh, wax free, a pound to a pound and a half cut, a good wet coat, then lightly sand it down. Then I'll apply my varnish over the top of that and it looks beautiful. It minimizes the blotch. I did a side by side once showing this on the same board that had, and you can still see like that, but it, it totally knocks it down. It does, it does lighten the absorption a little bit if you're going with an oil varnish, because that's a penetrating finish. So that's where you see the blotch is when you put like oil on there. If you just were going with shellac, you wouldn't have to worry about the blotchy finish, because that's more of a surface protectant. Um, but if you're going to put a dye stain or an oil finish that's going to absorb in there, then yeah, that I would put a, a, a coat of shellac. So I'm going to go back to a question John asked, because it kind of applies to what you just said. Is there a best finish for all species of woods, or does each one have a finish that works best? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, it's not one size fits all. You know, I was thinking about that tonight that, you know, there's something I, I, in a book I was reading about something, other topic, it was talking about how much we, uh, we go toward formulaic kind of living in our lives. You know, like, we, it's just easier if, you, if things are formulaic in the way, like, people talk to each other sometimes. Um, and... It would be easier if woodworking was just formulaic. And like you just said, okay, just do this and it's gonna work. You know, when I first started working with Pug Moore, it was, uh, I would say, I was confused with this very thing. I was saying, so what, what are you gonna do with the finish on this one? They go, oh, I'm just feeling my way along, Tom. That was how he said it. I'm just feeling my way along. And I'm like, I was halfway thinking, wait a minute, you know what you're doing. I know, you know, <laughs> surely you know what you're doing. It's like 50-something years doing this. And he was feeling his way along. But what he was saying was he was being responsive in a way to how it was working out. Like I just said, you know, you might have some blotchy woods, some not blotchy woods. So the deeper your, your bag of tricks, you know, or your res resources of approaches, or your experience, you've seen a lot, you, you realize that as time goes on, what he was really saying was he was, he was practicing the art of finishing, not a formulaic thing. It's an art, it's a relationship with what's happening as you're moving along. So that totally applies to different woods. Some woods have more oil in them. Some are open grain, some are lighter. Even with this, this cherry footstool that we're doing in this course, I had very light rail material compared to the darker cherry legs. And I was like, oh gosh, this is gonna create a real contrast in the finishing room. I'm gonna have to spend more time. I want this to turn out. So I ended up finding some darker pigmented colored cherry for the rails, just so we'd have better success there. There are ways of toning it, by the way, as well. So I would have gone there. I just didn't want to go all in on that, on this project. But yeah, there's all kinds of things. And then there's all kinds of effects that you might want to create. Sometimes you're trying to go darker or have a more distressed look or antique something, you know, or be protective or do an outside finish. The outside ones, I've done some of those recently, but I'm way more comfortable inside. You know, because I don't, I'd rather not throw, put what I make out in the sun in the rain. <laughs> but anyway, that's part of it. That's part of what you have to do. So I hope that answered the question. Yeah, there are a lot of variants. And I think these books and courses and just experience will get you really psyched about the art of finishing. I love it. Of course, companies, production lines, they must be formulaic. Okay. And some of the formulaic is putting a no-brainer finish on there. So a lot of times in production furniture, you'll notice everything looks so uniform. That's because they're not, usually they're hiding the real wood with like an opaque, almost paint stain so that everything 
in the showroom looks the same. You don't go, oh, wow, I wanted that beautiful piece of wood over there. Well, so they're usually they're hiding the beautiful mm -hmm. wood and they're using inferior wood because it's almost like a glamorous paint and it's got a beautiful look to it, but it's not the same. When we're working at home doing one of a kind, it can't really be formulaic. And we're trying to be more like the great masters of the old period, you know, and, and it's more of a relationship and it's an art. So that's what I always try to share. I hope you'll enjoy that part of it with me too. Okay. Tony says, I finished some pieces with deft. I need to refinish them. Lacquer is not available here anymore. What can I put over a deft slash lacquer finish? Oh, it's too bad. Wait, you must be in California. I would, yeah, that's what I would say. Just, um, well, another lacquer should be compatible. Maybe you can look on some of the forums or ask the question. But obviously, you'd love to just stick with deft. Deft was, when I used it, um, we used to use that a lot at Pugs. It's not a catalyzed finish, so you could sand it lightly and apply another lacquer, and it should melt in. You but, can't get the lacquer, though. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, I think you got to go over it. If you go over it, you could go over it with shellac, but shellac doesn't have the same durability and as the deft. So, but if you're going to go over it, you would definitely use wax-free shellac first, and then you could go to regular shellac. But I, I just prefer, I always preferred going over shellac with lacquer as the final, because lacquer is just that, a little more durable, and it's just thought of more as the finished coat. But if you wanted to go over it, um, you could sand it good. A little riskier would be putting a, um, like a sealer coat of shellac, a couple of them on there, wax-free shellac. It acts as a barrier coat between the lacquer and then, then you could put any, any kind of varnish on top of that. But now you're really building up your coats, you know? So it's tempting to almost strip it back and, and start there. And that's where, you know, when you're concerned about contaminants or issues there, I usually put the initial coats of wax-free shellac. That acts as a good sealer barrier coat for success with the more protective finishes like a varnishes or you know water locks or something like that on top. You could use something like that. So I hope that answers that question. Okay, it says I have installed water locks with a pad and found it leaving streaks on the top when it dries. Any idea why maybe what might be going on? Yeah, it's a little harder to wipe on water locks. Um, I would, I have found it works better if you can thin it up to 20%. So I actually padded on, I padded on like, I did a few shaker chests of drawers. Cut it to 30, 20%, you know, with mineral spirits and stir it up good. And you'll feel it just go on and put on thinner coats and just move along as it's wet. And you're gonna be surprised, it'll look really nice. And then, and then I would lightly sand between coats with like 320, and uh, you could hit it with a little, when I say 320, I mean just kind of lightly going over it. You could go a little finer than that if you're fine, but that'll work nice, and then you're gonna dust it. And then before the final coat, I hit it with steel wool after the 320 and then wipe that one on with still a thinner bodied and you're gonna, I think you're gonna find that it goes on a lot easier. And when you're padding, there was a guy, a really fine finisher, he used to use the bounty paper towels. He said something about the pressed pattern in there, it tended less to streak. So, you know, folding it in on itself and just, you know, wiping and overlapping strokes and not going back over it. So you're, you've got to be wet enough. The finish has to be thin enough and long strokes. And then don't go back if you can help it. And then, yeah, that's that. Okay. Can you use a scraper to affect raising the, how about using a scraper for the raised grain? Is that an option? Not really because a scraper, 
it doesn't cut like a, a plane blade. You know what I was saying about a plane shearing off the fibers so to a polished surface? A scraper has kind of a crushing cut. So you've got the burr is leaning down and it, it, it raises too. So you have to raise it after you're scraping as well. Okay, Andy says, I inherited a 150-year-old white, white oak cabinet. The wood seems really dry. Is there a way to rejuvenate the dry wood? I believe it has a shellac finish on it. Yeah, I would. Um, like, this is what I was saying about some old antique finishes would, would wipe on Danish oil on there. But given that you know there's shellac on there, you could clean it. You know, go over it with, like, mineral spirits. Let it dry, because the mineral spirits have a way of cleaning with steel wool, any kind of residue on there. And uh, why not hit it with a, another coat of shellac? Uh, it dries so fast, though. You might experiment in a small place with Danish oil, wiping it on, because it, it acts as a polish. And if you wanted to put shellac on after that, after the Danish oil is cured, you can. They're compatible, so you can go over the top of that after. But um, you might find that's the easiest thing, is to wipe, clean it, well, and then wipe it down, let it dry after the mineral spirits and all that, and then try it in a discreet small spot first just to wipe it with a little Danish oil. And I'll bet you just going over that whole thing, you know, one or two very thin coats. You, you put it on and then you're pretty much wiping it off. Do that like a couple times and it will look really nice. Yeah, somebody had asked about a product for cleaning wood projects before you work on them, and you just mentioned that. Is that what you would use, mineral spirits? Yeah, I use that a lot because okay. it cuts a lot of that wax off and um, gets rid of a lot of that mess. You really see the, the dirt on the... So I, I usually use the... Some, I'll use a, a fine 4 rot steel wool pad with mineral spirits and rub the surface and just clean it up. Let it really clean and then wipe it all down with paper towels or rags and a little more mineral spirits until you're getting less dirt on the rag and then uh, you'll feel good about going over at the next coats. But uh, that's where if you're unsure how it's going to, how receptive it's going to be, you want to build up a new uh, surface finish, then the wax-free shellac is a good barrier seal coat to start with after that. Okay, but I think you may have answered this earlier. Willie's asking, deft brushing lacquer, is it worth using? Which you, you kind of went into that as an option, so I'm assuming yes. Um, I haven't really talked about deft brushing lacquer, but yeah, that it works. It's, uh, yeah, it's a little trickier. We always prefer to spray it, though. If you can get it in the aerosol can, oh, it's a dream. It works really well. You can buy deft in the aerosol can, too. Not everywhere, obviously. But I haven't found it lately, but um, I heard it's still around, and it's a good product. But yeah, you can brush that. Okay, this is kind of a two-part question from two different people. So what, how do you determine what finish is on the piece if you'd like to refinish it? And then what finishes are, mo are harmonious with each other if you don't know what the previous finish was? Yeah, that's, that's a little tricky. But to find out what the finish is, it used to be that you could, especially if it's like an older piece, it's usually it was either shellac or lacquer. And the way you would test is just with a little um, Q-tip, just take some uh, alcohol, like denatured alcohol, even rubbing alcohol, some alcohol on the Q-tip and go to a discreet place and rub it on there. And if you see, all of a sudden, it's lifting the finish off. After about 30 seconds to a minute, it's shellac. Because the shellac, the alcohol will dissolve the shellac. However, if it's lacquer, alcohol is not hot enough a solvent to dissolve the lacquer. So after doing that, if that doesn't come off, then take the other end of the Q-tip or whatever and put it in lacquer thinner. And now rub another spot. And if it's it'll start to come off after that, and you'll know you got lacquer thinner. If that doesn't come off, then you know you probably have a type of varnish. So you got a harder varnish on there, and you don't really know what kind. You know, it might be, who knows? It might be uh, tongue oil or 
poly or whatever. There, when you're going to top coat over that, this is where you have the unknown. You can always test it in a discrete spot, but that's where you can sand it down. And what I just, the advice I just gave, you can spray on one or two, or brush on one or two thin coats of, of cuts on there, and then you can go. But you can also do a test without the shellac and see if what, you know, you could try some varnish over the top if you sand it enough. It might be compatible, but the, having the barrier coat gives you like, okay, I put this down, now I've kind of, I've prepared the surface to accept what I'm going to put on there next and in spite of what may be on there already. So I hope that answered that question. Yeah. We're getting close. Huh? Uh, well. Uh, I mean, okay, Joe's time. got a question about, um, sorry, I missed. Any recommendations on spray guns and will my pancake compressor be good enough or do I need something bigger to spray shellac? Yeah. Um, well, if you're just going to spray shellac, who is that? Joe. Joe. If you're just going to spray shellac, you don't need a really expensive, fine gun. Shellac's very forgiving. And you can buy a lot of guns these days for like 50 bucks or less. Like if you look in the Grizzly catalog, you know, you're going to get, I like this type of gun for, you know, where you have the gravity feed. There's less things to go wrong and get clogged up. So I would just get a gravity feed gun like this. The liquid goes in and it just comes down. That's fed by gravity, obviously. And the air pressure comes in here. And it goes through some valves and, and it gets uh, pulverized and actually comes in from different angles and hits the little stream of liquid and atomizes the liquid into a nice spray mist. That's what separates the good guns from the bad guns. Like really fine guns need to be able to atomize heavier liquids like um, paint or you know, the heavier lacquers that you're, you're spraying on automotive applications. You need different, you know, flow levels. So you have larger apertures or tips that you put in for the heavier, and you need more air pressure to atomize a heavier thing. But if you're just spraying shellac, shellacs are really kind of thin-bodied finish. You don't want a large opening, and you're going to be cutting it to like a pound and a half cut, so it's a nice thing and it doesn't need as much force and atomization it doesn't need as fine a gun to make it happen however so you can use a cheaper gun to do that i would start out with something cheap if you find you want to go further and higher then you can buy a more expensive gun um, but the pancake probably what happens is it's that that size of that can that you're you're putting compressed air in there. So the larger the vessel that's holding the compressed air, the less it has to recycle the motor to get that pressure, keep it up to the pressure. Because if you're draining like a, let's just for example, if you, if you had like a five gallon bucket and you were pressing that, but then you're spraying your gun constantly, you're gonna be dropping the pressure in that five gallon pretty rapidly and you're gonna find that your motor is kicking on a lot. Uh, you could start out and try it, but I think if you meant by pancake, I think those are pretty small bladders, <laughs> right? So that, that's going to go down, and your, what you find out is that your, your motor is on almost constantly, and it's maybe hard on a larger spray job, especially if you tried to spray lacquer. That's a little heavier bodied, you know? So I always had, for years, I had a 20-gallon tank, but now I have one of those big, bigger, like, I think it's a 50, 60, 80 gallon tank. So it doesn't cycle on very often at all because the pressure gets up in there and it takes a lot of air to come out before it drops to a low enough level where the motor wants to come on again. I hope that explains that. But yeah, that's, but it's, it's awesome to spray. I would highly encourage you to go for it and try it out. You, we did a shop night live on spraying shellac, right? Yes, we did. So um, that's a good one to see. 
because the whole key is just cutting it right and the technique and it's very forgiving and you get wonderful results. Yeah, I'm gonna, I've sh I told the folks here that I'm gonna cut off the questions at this point. Steve, there's a, some of the questions that were asked later on are answered earlier on so you can go back. Um, this last one from Tony, how long do you wait between um, applying, oh shoot, <laughs> forgive me. How long do you wait to apply shellac after Danish oil? And that'll be the last one here. Oh, if you put the Danish oil on, I would, I would wait plenty. Um, it depends on the drying conditions. If it's, if it's not, you know, if it's humid, you gotta wait several days. I would lightly sand, make sure the paper's not gummy. You wanna make sure it's just powdering and you can go over the top. I think it says usually like 24 hours, but I would be gracious about that and not in a hurry. That was one of Pug's sayings, never rush a finish. And I think about that every time I'm rushing a finish. <laughs> but that's, that's the key with that. Um, one thing I didn't mention is you can buy this. I think they still have this a Japan dryer. You can add a little of this to all um, oil-based finishes and paints, and it accelerates the drying, curing process. So you could add it. And sometimes if you're afraid, you got a little, maybe this is on the borderline of not curing. I would add, you know, it's like a little older, but not gone. If you add a little Japan dryer to it, just be careful that this, what's in these dryers also um, heightens the combustibility, like the spontaneous combustion. So you gotta, you always wanna be careful with storing the rags, but oil-based varnishes like this can self con spontaneously combust, so you know the whole that thing. That might have been a good tip to tell at the beginning of this. <laughs> Well, everybody is responsible knows. for reading the directions, yeah. and it, they we all hope. say that on there. Yeah, we just know more than a few woodworkers who have lost yeah. their shops over that one. Yeah. All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much. That was whew, that was a lot of questions, and I know a lot has gone on the chat, and I look forward to hearing about that. This is probably a good format. I mean, um, occasionally we demonstrate things, and I it's good because you've given me some ideas of things to highlight and demonstrate and talk about more in the future. I'll try some of these other finishes too, but. Yeah, we got some good ideas here for yeah. first. All right, topics. remember if you enjoy this content, please like, share, and subscribe, and head over to Epic Woodworking. Check out the site over there if you wanna get in on that Queen Anne footstool course, and also um, get on the mailing list. That's where you really find out everything new we got going on. So thank you so much for hanging out mm -hmm. and spending some time with us here in the shop. I always thoroughly enjoy it, and it's great to have the company. So we look forward to seeing you next time, right back here next Thursday on Shop Night Live. <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Thank you. I'll get the links put up there as fast as I can. So please come back and check them within the hour, if not sooner. Okay, take care.